All right, welcome everyone. It is 2-22-22. You are joined by the athens Clark County Commission and myself, Mayor Kelly Gertz, and some of our key staff from the manager's office and finance, as we are going to be gathering tonight with uh, longtime recipients of our independent agency funds. And so uh, every every agency is going to have a 20-minute slot, and I'll just ask commissioners that if you do have questions that would extend beyond that slot, um, just make time to engage with the principals in that agency, um, because obviously there's a lot that they do that that's certainly not going to be contained in, in any 20-minute discussion. So um, before I begin and introduce um, Joan Pree from Project Safe, Manager Williams, is there anything you want to add to the conversation? Uh, no, Mayor, just to clarify that uh, this is an annual uh, meeting that we have. And uh, informally, what we've said is that uh, in the years that we don't have any new commissioners coming into office, uh, then the, the, uh, the, the agencies that come forth to present are only those that are asking for an increase. Uh, and in, in years where we have new commissioners coming into office, we would invite all agencies so that they have the opportunity to share what their operations are about. Uh, so that's all I'd add, Mayor. Thank you. No, I appreciate that note. Thanks for thanks for reminding everyone of that. Uh, so with that said, um, we've got uh, Joan Pretty, Executive Director for Project Safe, here with us this evening. Um, and Joan, I'm going to go ahead and, and turn it over to you. The time is yours. Wow, thank you. I actually didn't realize I was first. I thought that I was just being really early because I think my slot says 550. But uh, I am happy to to start now. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm not taking somebody else's. Uh, no, I've got the library at 550, so uh, I'm going to. Okay, um, cool. Well, I will go then and I will keep us on on track. Uh, you all know this at Project Safe. We believe everyone deserves to be safe in their homes and safe in their relationships. And we, we work at that um, issue of intimate partner violence, domestic violence through crisis work, uh, crisis intervention, ongoing supportive services, systems change advocacy, and, and prevention and education. We have for a really uh, long time uh, received 5% funds, uh, which are um, not from the general fund, but this is, you know, part of the five uh, various add-on fines and fees and criminal um, proceedings uh, that are earmarked for victim services. And they are, they are split primarily between the district attorney's office and the solicitor general, just, uh, but then uh, Project SAFE has been receiving a very small uh, share of those um, for, for, for quite a long time. Uh, so we received $26,000 from that and uh, we use that to, to pay ever diminishing proportions of uh, two positions in our organization, one that works with volunteers and helps us to utilize and leverage unpaid uh, interns and staff to help um, continue and expand our work. And then another for one of our legal advocates and um, part of the uh, effort there is to review police reports um, and reach out, make proactive contact with folks who are named in the uh, police reports. Um, it's it's a, a big way of ensuring that people receive the kinds of support and the services that, um, that they need, even following um, perhaps a minor incident. Uh, and so that's what we use the, the $26,000 for. I'm asking for $31,000. Um, we uh, have not received a raise in 5% funds since 2008. Um, uh, I did go back and, and double check that. Um, and I had initially planned on, on going big. Uh, and asking for quite a bit more, um, and uh, then then had a bit of a of a change of, of heart with that. Um, we are facing a uh, rather significant potentially reduction in victims of crime act funding in the fall, um, and so I'm not looking to go as as big uh, as I thought I could in salary adjustments. Um, you know, one of the things that um, 
we have always done is kind of peg many of our salaries against the counties. And when you all lifted your base wage to $15 an hour, that, that put some real pressure on us, our base uh, for our part-time workers currently is 12. Um, and so I had hoped that we could see about getting our base in July up to 15. Um, with reductions in VOCA, that's significant. I don't see that happening realistically. And so, um, uh, but, but am hoping that we can still lift that base at least by a dollar uh, and continue a, a, a quick, I hope, march upward if we can stabilize that federal funding. So I had hoped that we could pay a bit more um, uh, with that $5,000 increase for what we're currently doing in those positions, which would free up some of our general funds to then spread out across some of those night and weekend positions that we, uh, it's overnight at the shelter that we pay that base wage. Um, you know, I lay out all the, the services and I, I look around, at least for the folks I can see on the screen. Um, I, I think you all are pretty familiar with, with the kinds of things that, that we do. I, I wanted to point out a couple things from the packet on page three. Uh, you know, this is always due very shortly after the new year. Um, and that's not always... Um, the easiest time for some of our staff to get all of their services in and reported. And so I show you that we had 2,309, so 2,309 uh, hotline calls uh, in 2021. It was actually 2,393. So we had a, a decent chunk more than that. Um, we did shelter 121 people in our emergency shelter, but we also had um, 21 more people in motels last year. So really we sheltered 142 people over that, that year. Uh, we had a 12 additional folks in rapid rehousing and transitional housing. Um, and you know, our shelter where we have a number of shelters in our, our community, ours is unique, not just in dealing with domestic violence, but you know, we're the only shelter that takes pets. We got a cat and a dog right now. Um, uh, you know, and so that helps families to stay together. It helps survivors to uh, make that jump to, to leave a relationship. We're the only shelter that takes unaccompanied minors. We had four last year. So teenagers that don't come in with parents. Um, and, and again, that's sort of unique to the issue that we deal with in domestic violence, intimate partner violence, that um, safety sometimes that we do that. Um, so, you know, in addition to, to housing folks, we also have our outreach work where our legal advocates work. Um, we had 538 outreach clients, so, so people who are dealing with domestic violence that we're working with in that office in the Family Protection Center. And then we had 533 people that we um, communicated with following review of arrest reports. And that's, you know, directly uh, one of the things directly funded by this. Um, we also provide a lot of client assistance, and the county helped with that with uh, indigent um, funds this year. We had a good bit of those. We were moving a lot of people into housing with that. But, you know, we leveraged a lot of other um, funding to help with that. And, and just recently, we had an example of uh, a woman with uh, a number of children that we helped move out of her home with her abusive partner into a new apartment. Um, got her all squared away there. Um, he just recently tried to break in and was trying to bust the door in. Um, by the time the police came, he had run off. The thing that kept him from being able to do so were the safety bars that we had provided uh, to her. We provide a lot of things like security cameras, other kinds of security features so that not just moving someone into a new location, but if that person is still trying to get them, um, uh, trying to help them in that way too. We spent over $210,000 on that kind of client assistance last year. And that's, that's all with um, uh, other funding. We're able to raise other donations and such. Um, another big win for us last year in our systems change advocacy front was the passage of the dating violence uh, civil protection order law uh, that Governor Kemp signed July 1. Um, did a lot of work 
getting that going. That was a gap in our family violence statute that did not address um, people in a dating relationship, which of course is uh, something we run into a lot in our community. Um, it was a long time coming trying to get the support to to address that gap. Um, and so we were we were thrilled to finally get that through and have done quite a bit of training, um, not just locally, but statewide on that civil protection order. Um, and, you know, the other thing that we're really interested in is is prevention work. Uh, so we do so much in the aftermath of, of abuse, and that's that's really important because it has such devastating consequences. But um, our dating violence text line, we had um, about 120 conversations um, with uh, young people on that last year where they're really feeling out what's okay in a relationship, what's not. If I said I wanted to have sex one time, does that mean it gets to do it any time after that? Uh, we get that question a lot. We get a lot, you know, so really helping people understand and navigating what's healthy in a relationship and what's unhealthy and, and how to um, either address it or, or perhaps end it if that's appropriate before we're married and have children and are living together and, and, and things escalate a great deal. So we do a lot with that. Um, and I've been, you know, having conversations with Danny at um, uh, Georgia Conflict Center, Commissioner Houle uh, connected us. And, and we're really interested at the same time that we're working with our law enforcement and prosecution partners in the situations where that approach is necessary. We're really interested in how we can partner with others around restorative justice options when couples are, are wanting to stay together and there is perhaps a healthy path forward um, to, to, to deal with that and, and support them in that way. Um, so we're always expanding, growing, you know, we're like always trying to think of what's the next approach, what's the next thing that we can do uh, to, to help people be safe in their homes, be safe in their, their relationships. But we are asking for that, that nudge up and, and do recognize that this is not an increasing pie uh, that we're pulling from here. Um, but uh, wanted to go ahead and make the request. It's been, been a long time since we've had a raise. So I'll, I'll stop there. I see I've, I've gone a, 11 minutes. Uh, I'm sure there's uh, room for questions uh, if anyone has them and, um, Blaine, I got our audit yesterday. So I'm going to send that over to Chris. Uh, I didn't have it at the time I, I submitted, but COVID struck the accounting firm that was doing our audit Their Their December and January was real rough. So we, we were a little behind in that, but I've, I've got a nice one. Thanks, Joan. I appreciate that. Uh, in the few minutes we have, are there questions from commissioners? Hey, Tim. Carol. Thank you. And yeah, thanks for being with us, Joan. Uh, just a really quick, simple question. Uh, just looking over the, uh, the material that you sent over and it had that 85% uh, of the, of the uh, clients that y'all work with are ACC Gov athens Clark County residents. I was just curious, uh, although the 15% is a small percentage from the nearby counties, I'm guessing, but do you all receive any uh, public funding from any other uh, uh, nearby counties? Right. So like the 5% funding from, from other counties? No, we don't. And the, the, the proportion really does drop. Um, we do actively serve Madison, Oglethorpe, and, and Oconee counties. Um, I did reach out quite a long time ago and, and about those 5% funds. Um, but in those counties, you don't have a DA and a solicitor. You just have a district attorney's office. They are utilizing those funds for their um, victim advocacy programs. And it is a zero sum game um, as, as they see it, that if we give this to you, then, we, you know, we have less and kind of fewer resources overall. So um, I was uh, not responded to favorably uh, when I... <laughs> But, but again, when you, when you look at the thousands, uh, and it is several thousand people that, it, you know, again, it's always over 85% are coming from athens Clark County. It is the very biggest chunk of what we deal with. Okay, thanks. Appreciate it. 
Errol, you had a question as well? Yeah, yeah, just, um, hey, Joan, hi, Joan. Thank you for hi. all this wonderful work again and again. Um, um, I'm just like back home from being away and I wasn't focusing totally when you said something and I just want to understand it better. You get such a small amount of money of your total revenue from us again. Um, and I and I believe you were focusing in on the work, what you actually do with that work and was that paying for? Could, could you just summarize that again for me? Yeah, so the... The $26,000, when we initially asked for it, and it was a little bit lower, but, yeah. but moving back in 08, you, you know, which was the last time we got a raise in this, um, how we do it is we split it and it pays for a small portion of the position that works with volunteers. Mm -hmm. And it pays for a small portion of our legal advocates that does the police report review and outreach. At the time that we initially applied for this funding, both of those were expansion positions for us. And the the amount we got paid for a bigger chunk of, of, of each right. one. Yeah. Um, it actually serves as the match on a you know on a grant for, for one of them too. And so it, it it is leverage in that way also. And so that's why in the packet of materials, I sort of focus on where we're able to utilize the unpaid labor and have greater mm -hmm. outputs through that um, uh, with our crisis intervention work and then where we use it in the um, in the outreach. Um, and so the packet, although I give you a run through kind of everything we do in the beginning, mm -hmm. it is focused primarily on how we use that, that 26,000. And even though it's small, it is combined with other things that then allow it to um, have a greater splash than it would otherwise. Mm -hmm. and, and you've had quite a um, you've had quite a like reduction, I guess, because of COVID here from your other revenue sources. I mean, it you know was significant enough where you were at one point six nine million in twenty one, and now you're projecting one point four million. So I guess it's about you know, right. 250,000. How, you, how have you guys dealt with that? So we've had these kind of like fluctuations and it, where some things drop and other things raise. And so it's not been as dreadful, but we've had some significant drops in some sources and then increases in others. We had some staff movement that we were able to consolidate positions. So, so for example, I was able to combine two positions into a director of community and student engagement. Um, and, and we kind of took advantage of some attrition and movement and interest variation in our, in our staff and kind of re recalibrated. Um, uh, so, you know, one of our longtime advocates is now the, the director of victim advocacy in Deborah Gonzalez's office. And so then we kind of retooled how we um, do our uh, advocates within the shelter and brought in somebody, um, you know, much younger and newer and, you know, had savings there. And so I was able to play around a lot um, to accommodate those reductions. I don't have that kind of wiggle room really for any more. Um, and these, these VOCA cuts, which will affect a, a lot of programs across the state, governmental and nonprofit. Um, they're not really COVID related. They're, they're related to the sources of VOCA funding and, and the, the prior uh, administration's uh, lessening focus in pursuing the sort of crimes that, that populate that VOCA fund. And so now there's kind of a reduction that's been some years coming. Um, but we've been able to, to, to make it work. We're excited about um, Dancing with the Athens Stars returning. Um, and Chris Mayor Gertz and his wife, Andrea, will be our MCs this year. Uh, so we're excited about getting back in, into public spaces. But we've had a lot of support from the community, from donors through this, too. Um, and that's made a big difference. Um, so we've, we've made it work. Um, we haven't laid anyone off or anything like that. Um, we just did some consolidation, and I, I, I think they were good measures. But I don't have any more of those cards in the deck.
Well, Joan, thank you for that overview. Um, we appreciate the work you and your staff do every day. I know it's not easy, and you just described a couple of the sorts of challenges, and I know that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, for uh, commissioners, uh, if you want to engage further with Joan or Project Safe staff, by all means, I know she's always been very accessible and easy to talk to. So um, we appreciate uh, we appreciate your time. Um, we are going to move on next to. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, the Athens Clark County Library. Uh, I know we've got uh, several folks who are here from there. Um, if, uh, if somebody from the library wants to unmute and introduce uh, your team, we are glad to have you here. Thank you, uh, Mayor Gertz. Uh, this is Jane Russell. I'm the, I'm chairing the uh, board of trustees in uh, the at the Athens Clark County Library right now, and we're going to do a little rolling chair thing to introduce a couple of other people. Val Bell, the executive director, is here. I'm here. Hello, and Mamie Fike, who's our business manager, is here as well. So lots of folks to answer questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll just do a quick overview, and then of course we'll move to questions. We do thank you for this opportunity. Um, I would like to remind you of the mission and goals for the athens Clark County Library, and it is to have a positive and lasting effect on every individual who interacts with the library by reflecting our values outwards and enabling everyone to expand their horizons, interests, knowledge, and educational aspirations in an atmosphere of safe exploration. We, um, <clears throat> excuse me, have a vision statement, engaging communities and exceeding expectations. We expect ourselves to be inclusive, uh, supportive of our community, respectful, committed to excellence and welcoming. The goals for the coming year are five. First one is to increase the staff of library, the, excuse me, the salary of library staff to a livable and competitive wage base from $10 per hour to $15 per hour without wage compression. The second one is to continue to support students and caregivers through programs and partnerships with an emphasis on early childhood literacy. During FY 2023, we will develop five new partnerships with local organizations, nonprofits, community leaders, and or agencies to further enhance the mission and goals of both organizations. The fourth, to complete and institute a new five-year strategic plan by the end of FY 2023. And the fifth goal is to continue the planning process for something that I think excites everybody in the whole community, and that is the new library facility on the east side of Athens, including securing state capital outlay funds in the amount of $2 million to add, obviously, to the Spilos money. Um, just a few other points about the impact of the library on the community. From a technological standpoint, we have begun to circulate Chromebooks and hotspots to the community to aid in broadband access. We've recently rolled out mobile printing so patrons can print on demand from home, from a, a phone, a laptop, a tablet, whatever device they might have, and be able to print here at the library. And this is a, a really wonderful tool. Um, impact on adults and seniors. We've received a grant, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Institute of Museum and Library Science to install hearing loops in our auditorium, meeting rooms, and story, story room. And this will help people who are hard of hearing and have a hearing aid to be able to um, connect to the system. Impact on community and business engagement. For Library Card Sign Up Month, we organized a Get Library Carded program and enlisted businesses to offer discounts on their services if a resident showed a library card, and that was a success. We continue to partner with Chess and Community, hosting the event weekly and through grants, uh, a grant, excuse me, ensure that the next step of these uh, students is inspired and they have the equipment that they need from 3D printers to drones to virtual reality, glasses, and of course, life-size chess pieces and boards. That's the part I understand. The other stuff I'm not so sure about. <laughs> um, our impact on people in need, and I think this is a really important thing for people to understand about the library. 
um, lots of folks come here who really don't have another place to go during the day. And we have a trauma-informed social work program that it's back up and running after the pandemic. And we expect to have two interns from the UGA School of Social Work. And we've hired a part-time social worker who's also a degreed librarian to help lead this important piece of Athens society. And then impact on student success, the public library access card for youth, otherwise known as the play program, is almost ready for launch. And we hope it would be this month. And this program will offer all CCSD uh, Clark County School District uh, students from elementary through high school a free library card with no fines using their student IDs. This single service will open up library resources online and in print for every student in Clark County. We expect this will make an impact on literacy and educational improvement for the, all the students. And we continue to offer the tutor.com program free of charge for which works uh, is of help to students and adults offering standardized test prep, resume uh, review and feedback, live tutors to help with specific questions and problems. And then a final point that I'd like to make is with respect to sort of the return on investment. If you look and it's, it's you've got this in the document that was submitted to you, the performance measures of all the different things that the library does, the return on investment is $4,128,734, which is about twice what we graciously get from the, uh, from the county. And that's pretty special, I think. And then this year, this past year, we were also able to get five grants totaling $110,500 plus dollars, which were very helpful to all of our programs. The main thing that we're asking for with respect to the budget for this year is um, wage increases. There are five categories of uh, within the, the staff, the, the way it's broken down here. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the first two categories, the, the wage increase that we're asking for gets people to a living wage, which is, as we all know, crucial. We've got folks, they're basically part-time folks, if I'm not mistaken, who are paid as little as $9 an hour. And we're trying to get people to $14 or to $15 an hour in those first two categories. The other three categories are um, basically professional librarians and full-time folk as well. And we, we're looking at a percentage increase there. And by doing that and looking for this whole package at one time, which we understand is a big ask, but that will uh, avoid salary compression, which is a really great thing to avoid. And it will also um, get folks on a, on a par with people within their professions in general and also with the other county employees. So that's what, we've, what we're presenting to you. Val and Mamie will answer questions. I'll answer anything that I can, can help with. And thank you very much for this opportunity. Great, thank you so much for that. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, commissioners, wanna go ahead and open it up to questions for library board and staff. Not all at once now. Uh, there's uh, okay. Commissioner Houl, uh, Denson, and Myers. Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for this presentation. I'm really excited to hear that y'all are planning to bring up that wage floor. Um, and I guess I just wanted to get clarity. This may just be you repeating yourself, um, but if, if we're to fully fund this request, are you saying that in the start of the next fiscal year, the wage floor would be brought up for all employees, including part-timers, to 15 an hour? Or would it uh, still phase in over time? No, it would bring everybody up to um, everybody, almost everybody up to $15 an hour. Uh, the first uh, six people are our interns and our shelvers, and it would bring them to $14 an hour. The interns are paid interns, usually from UGA getting a degree and using it for credits. Um, so that's the that's the one exception. And the uh, the um, uh, uh, library shelvers really is a is a job for students. Um, but we've been fortunate enough to have UGA students uh, primarily doing that job. But everybody else, uh, the other um, major category where we have the most staff is uh, 
staff working um, basically for 10 to about $10 an hour. It's 29 staff. Um, they work 247 hours a week, and that would bring them up to $15 an hour this year. Okay, awesome. Um, and then my follow-up question, if I if I may, um, I saw that your projected request for next year lowers again. Um, could you maybe clarify why that would be? Because um, the way I'm currently hearing this, I'm imagining that if you're paying these wages this year, you'd need to again next year. But yes, I don't I don't know where they lower again. But this would be yeah, this would be the the base. Okay, yeah, I was looking at kind of in our request summary, maybe this is more a question for staff, but I saw that it says the FY23 agency request is, you know, basically 2.56 million, and then it's the projected request for FY24 would be 2.43. I, I just looked at the document that I've got in front of me, um, and the okay. FY24 projected budget is 2.69. Two million six hundred ninety-four thousand six eighty-four. So maybe there's a typo someplace. Yeah. Good. Thanks for that, Tim. Uh, thank you, and uh, yeah, thank you, Jane Valerie, for for being here with us. Um, yeah, I, I I saw that same error, and it looks like the what was put in there for the total funding request was just the operational part, which is incorrect. But it's correct. It is correct further down. Um, the document that we have. Um, so my question is, uh, and, and I'm also um, glad to see this moving forward in this direction, um, but I do wonder uh, what what is the status of the, the state and federal funding? And is there any potential for increases or increased asks um, with those funding sources? And, and I, I mean, I'll, I am pretty ignorant about those funding sources. So if you could just very, very quickly just uh, Tell me what those are, too. Um, yes, there, it, uh, it's um, part of the legislative agenda uh, for an increase in state uh, reimbursed salaries. Um, and so the way we have done it um, here is that we have some people who work for the region um, and their state, their half salary, state reimbursed and half salary for the most part, half salary for from um, Athens Clark. And the reason for that, we've been trying to get it to the 50-50 uh, mark. Um, and the reason for that is because those um, uh, athens Clark County makes up about half of the population of our region. So, but yes, there is an increase uh, for uh, that's, that's planned um, for uh, state workers, but that has not, obviously, it's still in the legislature. We don't know if that's going to go through or not. Okay, and that's that's the that's the flat five thousand dollar increase. Yes. Okay, and so that is not budgeted into uh, the expected revenues sheet that we have. Um, the people who would be in that um, in that line are the people um, in the green section, number five. Um, those are the people who would be getting the uh, nine percent because the way. And I, I may ask Mamie to try and explain it a little more. It's not a one-to-one of -one, uh, $5,000. It's, um, correct? It's not $5,000. Oh, it is a one-to-one. -one. Oh, okay. She's telling me that it is a one-to-one. -one. I thought it was not. So, yes. And I'll just add. Go ahead. In, let me let me get her in. So uh, it, on the line here, um, the reason why we didn't we at the time of this we didn't know about that, and so I kept the state funding, and you see it on the um, we get money for materials, personnel, and uh, right now we're getting COVID money. It's eight ninety five, and then next year we're not expected to get the COVID money. And so I kept that eight eight hundred fifty thousand straight across the board, but that potentially could go up if we get more money for salaries, um, more money, and more money for materials, and then that five thousand dollars per employee. So that we didn't know that at the time of this. Okay, thank you. So that's helpful. So so then it is potential that uh, the amount of money to fill that gap to get everybody to fifteen 
could be smaller and then we'll just have to follow up as we get closer to the state's budget uh, passage. Okay. Yes. All right. So, um, yeah, so I guess I, I would love for us to get, uh, once that happens, I know uh, it might be, it's going to be a matter of weeks. Uh, once that happens, we'd love to have more clarified numbers of exactly what that ask would be, obviously. But thank you for that. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. And uh, Carol had a question as well, and we'll wrap with that. Yeah, I'm, I'm just, they, they've covered, my colleagues have covered my questions. You know, I just want to thank you all for this. Uh, you know, I think we're all big supporters of the library and the kind of um, use that it gets from the community. It's such a positive expression of government and taking care of each other in a, in just such a wonderful way. You guys do a great job. So thank you. Thank you. That's nice to hear, you know, coming from the, uh, from, from pretty difficult times, as I know you all know, um, we're, we're coming back stronger and, uh, actually Athens Clark is going to have our first in-person, uh, program tomorrow night, uh, celebrating, uh, Black History Month with, uh, um, African-American artists. Um, so that'll be our first, uh, in-house adult program. So we're coming back. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Thank you. We really appreciate the work you all do every day. Thank you. Thank you. Be safe now. Take care. All right, friends, I think we're going to transition here in just a moment to a presentation from the Athens Community Council on Aging. We'll let all the library folks log off. And I know we have uh, Eve Anthony here from the Council on Aging. Hey, good evening, Eve. How are you? Good evening. Good to see everyone. Good to see you too. You doing well? Doing well. Thank you very much. Good, good. Well, I appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, we've got uh, uh, 20 minutes to spend together. And so uh, turn it over to you so you can use the time uh, as you'd like. And then there may be a couple of follow-up questions from commissioners. Okay, sounds great. Thank you so much for having me tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to see everyone and check in again this year. Um, joining us is Seth Robinson, and Seth is ACCA CPA, and he works on the budget portion of our proposal each year. So he's joining us in case there are some questions that I may not be able to answer. Um, this good. year, sorry, Eve. <laughs> oh no, you're good. Thanks, Seth. Um, this year, ACCA is asking for two hundred sixty-seven thousand three hundred dollars for personnel expenses. In addition, we are asking for $70,000 in capital expenses, and those this request is $50,000 more than what we have asked for in previous years. Um, just as a reminder, the funds are used to operate our federally mandated Older Americans Act programs. So these are the programs that are mandated by the Older Americans Act for every community to provide for their seniors. Um, these programs allow people to age in place, and they're referred to as home and community-based programs. So that's our athens Clark County Senior Center, which we rebranded as the Center for Active Living. It's our Meals on Wheels program, and then it's our transportation program. And then in addition, these dollars help provide matching funds and support for our Adult Day Health program, our Grandparents Raising Grandchildren program, our Retired Senior Volunteer program, our older worker program that's referred to as CSEP, and then our foster grandparent program. Um, we receive federal dollars for each of those programs, and those federal dollars, as you all may be aware, with the funds that the county may receive, but they do require a 10% local match. And so for every dollar that we receive from athens Clark County, we're able to, for this these particular programs, we're able to draw down $9 from the federal government for those programs. Um, we're proud of these programs. They are designed and they're looked at continuously to make sure that they match the current needs of older adults in our community. Um, we, we record, we collect, and we demonstrate impact on food insecurity. Um, we have a 38% decrease in food insecurity for those folks in our Meals on Wheels Senior Center and other food programs. Um, social isolation, transportation, 
access to health care, and then underemployment. And when we look at the statistics for older adults in our community, these are the impact areas that are most important. So we did ask for a $50,000 increase on our capital um, request from previous years. In previous years, you all have given us $20,000. We use those funds to cover the cost of a new vehicle for our transportation program. Um, over the last several years, we have used those funds to put towards the cost of a smaller vehicle, so either a minivan, a small SUV, something that we can provide one-on-one -on -one trips for people, um, older adults in our community, but also use for Meals on Wheels routes, other senior hunger initiatives. Um, our ombudsman used them to visit nursing homes, assisted living, um, other things in the community. We really appreciate that support over the last few years during COVID when it wasn't safe to put older adults on a 15 passenger van. We use those smaller vehicles to ensure the safety as we were providing those one-on-one -on -one transportation trips because we needed to continue to provide transportation since we're taking a lot of older adults to um, dialysis appointments, other medical appointments, urgent appointments in the community that they had to get to. Um, after Meals on Wheels, transportation is the number one requested service from the Council on Aging. Over the last several years, and especially in, within the last 12 months, as I'm sure you all experienced and you've heard from everyone else, our expenses are not matching our revenue. Our revenue for this program has remained flat for the last 10 years. Um, our reimbursement rate from, our, from the Area Agency on Aging, which provides our federal and state funds, is $8 a trip. Our actual cost to provide a trip is closer to $14. Um, we are seeing increased expenses on the maintenance of our vehicles. A lot of that is related to the age of our vehicles. Our minibuses are aging. Um, the miles that are on them, it just requires more maintenance. Gas, as you all know, gas, the cost of gas has gone up. And then our increased driver wages. We're really proud um, and have spent a lot of effort and board support to increase the wages of our employees, specifically our direct care staff. Um, since 2020, our direct care staff started at $8.50 an hour. We're now at $12 an hour um, with the goal by 2024 to increase our direct care staff starting wages. That's anyone starting at ACCA will start at a minimum of $15 an hour. Um, but that does, that does cause an increase in the expenses for our transportation program. And over the last three years, the program has run an average annual loss of more than $13,000 each year. So this increased request would cover the full cost to replace the oldest vehicle in our fleet, and that is a 2009 minibus. So over the last year, the last time we were all together, I um, just wanted to give a quick breakdown on the things that we were we feel very successful about and some of the challenges that we've had as an organization. Um, again, want to thank you all so very much for the opportunity to partner to provide the Athens Eats Together program. Um, I can't say enough about how much you all should pat yourselves on the back. Um, we don't know of any other community that made that level of an investment to ensure that all of the residents had access to food. And I know of no other time in the history, and I've been with, with ACCA for 21 years, I don't know of any other time in our history that every single person in our community had access, access to food. All they had to do was call. Um, and so that was an amazing um, opportunity for us. So thank you guys so much for, for giving us the opportunity to do that. By the end of the project, we had provided 341,791 meals to 9,118 residents in athens Clark County. That number was a 4,000% increase from our traditional service numbers at ACCA. And in addition, that allowed us to ensure that our 57 employees remained employed for the entire time during COVID as all of our direct service operations closed. Um, it also allowed our partner, um, Epstein Events and others, to ensure that they kept their staff employed. So thank you guys so much. That was an amazing community investment. Um, in May of, of last year, we were able to reopen 
all of our programs. And that was a happy, happy day here at ACCA was to be able to welcome older adults back to our campus. Um, we, through our Meals on Wheels program, we enrolled at the height of the pandemic, 800 additional older adults. Um, thank goodness, once everything started to reopen, a lot of those older adults were able to use their previous resources for food, but we still have 75 older adults, um, additional older adults who are receiving Meals on Wheels services, who are eligible for, for the services and receiving those. Um, our, after our adult day health program here in, in our Athens campus called the Bentley Adult Day Health Program has not returned to pre-COVID numbers. Those older adults, we were making really good strides. And then when the Omicron variant hit, those people went back into their homes. As you can understand, they are the frailest of the older adults in our community, many living with Alzheimer's or other dementias. Um, so that program, we're at so far year to date, a $225,000 loss with a projected loss of $385,000 for the year. Um, we're hopeful that we're going to receive some more emergency relief funding from the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare to help cover, cover some of those losses. We're also hopeful that as the weather starts to get warmer and the cases decrease, that we're going to welcome many of those adult day health clients back. Unfortunately, a lot of them were lost during the pandemic. Um, many are residing in nursing homes, have moved out of the community, or unfortunately passed away during the pandemic. Um, and across the board, as in I'm sure you've heard from everyone else, you know, and, and you are seeing yourselves, the cost to provide our services are increasing as our, our revenue has not caught up. Um, so we are um, also celebrating. In March, we will celebrate 50 years of Meals on Wheels service to the Athens community. Our Meals on Wheels program started in 1972. It was the second Meals on Wheels program in the state of Georgia and is now running as the oldest Meals on Wheels program in the state of Georgia. Um, our Adult Day Health program will turn 50 years old in 1972 as well. In I'm sorry, in not, it's our, it started in 1972, but in September. Um, and it also was the second um, Adult Day Health program in the state of Georgia and now continues as the oldest Adult Day Health in the state of Georgia. So we will be sending you all invites for some of those celebrations, hopefully in September. Um, Adult Day Health will be running at full capacity again, and we'll be able to welcome you and to, to say hello and to see that program. But again, thank you all so very much for the opportunity to speak with you tonight about our services. And if you have any questions, I'd love to answer those for you. Thanks, Eve. I appreciate that. Thanks for everything your team does every day for the community. Uh, are there questions from commissioners for Eve? Carol. Hey, Eve, thank you again, echoing um, Mayor Gertz, wonderful, wonderful work. Um, the, the replacement vehicle, the projected, you know, uh, ask for this coming year, um, looks like you're gonna do this, like it, in, it's listed as the same for the following year. Um, is that, um, is there another vehicle or is there, can you explain a little bit behind that? Yeah, so we put the request in for this year. We have not said we were going to ask for it, but anticipating based on the age of the vehicles. So the one that we're asking for is a 2009 minibus. The next one, I believe, is 2011. Um, and then the, then the next one is 2016. Oh, yeah, yes. Okay, now I'm, I'm reading the last line again. Thank you for repeating that for me. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking. Uh, other commissioners? Mr. Mayor? Yeah, go right ahead. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, thank you for the words, Eve. Uh, and I'm really thankful for the work your organization has done in administering the Athens Eats program. Uh, it is comforting to get some validation. You know, a lot of times we do our research, do our work, implement programs. It's really 
uh, validating to get some feedback um, hearing from you, you know, that there was no other community that you know of that had so robustly supported uh, the needs of the community for food. Um, I'm, I'm just thankful that you were there and were able to administer it. And, you know, just th thanks for your kind words. You know, I, I know a lot of crazy things have happened uh, with pandemic payments around the nation. I know in Alabama, they were building prisons. Um, but I, I think we made some good choices here in Athens. And even though we, we've gotten some, some hate from some corners about some choices we made, it, it sure is comforting to hear from the folks on the ground actually feeding the hungry that we've been doing a good job. So thank you for, for providing that feedback, Eve. Absolutely. And again, thank you. We, yeah. we have go a, ahead, Eve. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, mayor. Go, go ahead, Eve. Sorry. I was just going to call on Tim uh, after, after you respond. We have a, also, if you all are interested and I can share with at any time, but we have a, a, a report that shows that demonstrates the impact and the people served and some of the comments from your residents about how important the program was. If you'd like, I could send that your way um, so you can see some of those. I, I, I think we did send it, but I know you all have had your hands full. And so you probably had a lot of things to look at, um, but we can send that Commissioner Edwards so that you can look at it again. But it truly did have an amazing impact on the community. Yeah, that, that'd be great. I appreciate it, Eve. I, I, I think I've got that in email, but I know it's buried. Um, uh, Tim, and then we'll wrap with Jesse. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for being with us, Eve. Really appreciate all the work that y'all do. Um, my, my question also is uh, actually dealing with the Athens Eats. And um, this is a, a big ambitious one, but it's actually the way that you even phrased it and stuff, that, that, that we were the only community and at that time that where we could basically guarantee that every single Athenian was able to have access to food. And I think obviously um, our goal would be able to have that, be able to state that at all times. Um, and I, I was very uh, impressed by the Athens Eats program. I was very impressed by the, the low uh, bar uh, of, of information or anything that needed to be provided for somebody to be able to take into that program. And I guess just like, cause you're on this call and we have, uh, the mayor and the county manager, all these commissioners on here, I would love for us to be able to explore that we can make that guarantee every year there is 365 days a year, um, not just when we're in a pandemic. And so if there's ways that we could possibly explore that we can be working together in the way that we did during this pandemic, during the height of the pandemic, to ensure that that is happening again, um, I, I think that's I think that's really the goal that we should be pursuing, one of, one of the goals that we should be pursuing here. Um, so just throwing that out there for us to possibly look look at that and moving moving forward in next year, if there's a way that we can uh, keep some level of that program going full time, um, I think it'd be worthwhile. And I definitely I very much appreciate the Council on Aging stepping up and being the uh, the main partner uh, in implementing that program. It was it was ambitious and it was impressive that y'all pulled it off. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner Denson, and thank you so much for your volunteer support for that program. That was absolutely critical. We, we designed Athens Eat so that we would collect data from the participants that answered some of the questions that we need to create sustainable hunger solutions in our community. So um, we are actually working to give that data to the Athens Wellbeing Project um, so that they can look at it. And it's broken out geographically. It's broken out by population. So we can target families. We can target older adults. We can target children. So hopefully that data will then be used to create some sustainable solutions. Uh, thanks, Eve, for, for your work with uh, the Wellbeing Project. And, and in terms of all things common cause there, uh, you know, one of the goals of a uh, prospectively expanded uh, food distribution facility um, with the Northeast Georgia Food Bank really is, is that, you know, hunger elimination is in the reference. So, um, Lots of lots of great work together, uh, Jesse. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks, and uh, this kind of dovetails with what Tim was just saying. And thanks a lot, Eve, for uh, everything. I'll just echo everybody on that. Um, did you say it was a four thousand percent increase? Yeah, I mean that's just a staggering in a positive way number. Um, but 
it really has left me sitting with the uh, assumption that we haven't, you know, had a 4,000% decrease in need since the funding for that program uh, ended. And, and so I guess I'm, uh, I'm also very interested in seeing what we can do moving forward to try to, to pick that back up because food deserts continue to be real and nutritional needs continue to be real. Um, so I, I'm not sure where to leave that besides hanging in the air as we wrap up today, but I hope that we as a body can get back together perhaps with someone from the Wellbeing Project and the Council on Aging to, uh, to kind of circle back on this before too much more time elapses. Yeah. And just to quickly clarify, that was a 4,000% increase from our service numbers. So just to clarify, but thank you. We appreciate that. Well, Eve, we really appreciate you and uh, Seth, you being with us and doing so much good work for the community. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you soon. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you all. It was wonderful to see everyone. Thank you. Have a good night. And y'all, uh, next up on tap on our round robin of independent agencies is the Classic Center Authority. And I uh, uh, see in the participant list, we have uh, Paul Kramer and Philip Verastrana over here from the Classic Center. And um, Paul, if you are ready, I will go ahead and turn it over to you uh, so you can provide us with some updates and then we'll have a few minutes for commission questions. Great. Am I able to share my screen? I think you can. Let me just make sure that's the case. All right. I am making you a presenter right now. And so uh, in just a moment, you should see the little pop up on your screen that says you're a presenter and you should be able to share. There it is. All right. I love it when it actually works that way. Um, <clears throat> I really am excited to share our budget information with you, but I, I'd be remiss if I didn't start this out just by thanking all of you. Um, this has been a long journey uh, for us, and uh, what made it better was the support that we did receive from you uh, every step along the way. Uh, as we, I think, remain focused on not just the pandemic, but how we would emerge out of the pandemic uh, at the end of all of this. So uh, with that, I will uh, move through the presentation. You know that hospitality was amongst the hardest hit uh, with COVID-19, and many thought that we would lose the momentum, uh, but hopefully through this presentation, you'll see that we found ways to uh, make your building even stronger. Um, one was that we, we had great numbers coming out of 2019. In fact, it was the best year that we have ever had with the Classic Center. 670 events, 3.3 million more tickets sold than ever before. Our impact on the community, 46 million and 400 thousand attendees uh, coming out of 2019. Of course, then uh, in March of 2020, uh, COVID hit and hit hard. And when the University of Georgia mentioned that they were not having students come back in that one day on that Friday, the 13th of March, uh, we lost $1.7 million in space rent. Um, so our numbers of employees dropped uh, precipitously. And um, what we always knew was that we needed to keep the team that could eventually rebuild the Classic Center. Uh, you have to remember this was an operation that had been up and running for 26 years. So uh, we very thoughtfully kept the employee base that we knew could restart us once again when we were able to really host folks coming in. In the meantime, you might remember that we had BioPlanet move into our exhibit hall and we did not ask them to pay an exorbitant amount of money for that space. What we asked them to do was to interview each and every one of the people 
that we had to let go in order to make ends meet uh, with the Classic Center. Then we got certified. We actually dug in deep to find ways that we could operate the facility and operate safely with the very best standards that were out there. If you look at the chart on the right-hand side, you'll see that even in the height of the pandemic, in FY21, we were able to host 370 events. Now, I'll admit they were not 370 events that were of the size that we typically host. They were much smaller, much more spread out. And again, athens Clark County stepped up to help us uh, through those days with the uh, judges and doing jury over here at the Classic Center. And we were very, very appreciative. I should also mention that our uh, entry protocol was very strict and that the staff that we did have uh, was double teaming to work that entry protocol for each and every one of those events, making sure that we were as safe as we could. Then indeed we got strategic. Uh, I mentioned in FY19, it was a great year. We had 1.5 million in retained earnings. Largely we had that so that we could redo our performing arts venue. That was uh, targeted as a capital project. But when FY20 came around, we actually had a deficit of $430,000. Um, and then we kind of came back and rebounded in 21. A lot of that was focusing on the areas of our business that would not be directly impacted by the meetings uh, industry, ice skating, being able to do meetings online, uh, virtual meetings. We did a tremendous amount of them. And then of course, parking. But I can't not talk about our partners here. Um, what I think really made a huge difference was Levy, our food service vendor. Contractually, they were required to send us a check for 400000 And there was a conversation because they knew that we were not going to do anywhere near the numbers that we ordinarily would do. But they sent that check anyway. And because we were future focused on the arena and what it could do to lift us up after the pandemic, um, they were also able to give us a million dollars to be used now to get through the tough times. So, uh, and those events that I had talked about that we did do earned us 1.4 uh, through that uh, 21 year. Then we did get resourceful. Uh, you might remember while there was a lot of bad happening, uh, the good news was that interest rates were low and we were, again, with your help, able to refinance our debt and, uh, and do so in a way that allowed us to hold on to the cash assets that we had to make it through the pandemic while we invested uh, back into the facility and we very thoughtfully didn't just do the um, performing arts venue. Uh, we also looked ahead and uh, were able to update our atrium and our kitchen, knowing that when the pandemic was over, we would still be struggling to get back uh, financially to where we needed to be. But we didn't want your venue to suffer uh, along the way. So we aren't just up to date, we're actually a little ahead of our capital plan uh, currently. We also say that we got brighter. Uh, this community is really an amazing place. Uh, we knew coming out of the pandemic that we would need to be super strong with recruitment and training and uh, offer something that no other venue in the area could offer. We've always given away 30,000 in scholarships uh, for students in the area of the arts. Uh, but we worked really hard at fundraising and brought the Paul T. Martin Hospitality Fund up. So through that effort, we are now offering 30000 uh, through the Paul T. Martin, the Jack and Ann Crawley Scholarship. All of that rolled up means that we're offering 60000 total now going out to students in our community, which is really making a big difference. We've also partnered more than ever before. We started two brand new pathways with our own career academy through that uh, downtime. And then we finally took the learning lab to a new level. So Piedmont now 
their students can uh, elect to take a class whereby they work inside the classic center and go through our whole management program, which has been aligned with their uh, curriculum. So those students will actually receive pay and receive uh, credits while they go through that. We're hoping to replicate that with uh, UGA and Athens Tech. Um, we got ecological uh, as well. Along the way, uh, Philip did note a little typo. It's not five electric vehicle chargers. We actually installed nine of them. Many of them you'll see right out in front of the building. And then uh, you may remember it was just before all this went down, we invested in that guaranteed performance contracting. Uh, and now we finally have the full numbers that have come back to tell us what that saved the Classic Center going forward. And it's 1,766,000 1, kilowatts uh, were actually saved through that effort. Uh, but I like the way that Kurt says it best. We nearly doubled the size of our facility and yet we're using less energy today than when we first opened the building, which I think says a lot. Um, and I want to thank Train and Georgia Power for their help in, uh, in making those things happen. Um, but we also stayed true to your vision of having a significant solar install. And I think on every call as we were going through uh, the arena creation, again and again, one of the commissioners would say, well, Paul, how big is the solar install going to be? And it's taken me forever to be able to answer that question. But here you have the numbers uh, in terms of what we expect that solar uh, will look like. It will be uh, over the entire roof of the Classic Center and over the top of the arena as well. And uh, we think it will be a, a huge impact on our overall operation. Um, and so I thank you for pushing us in that direction. Uh, it is not final. I don't have a contract yet, but I am confident that this is what we're going to be looking at as we go forward. Um, what I'm probably most proud of the board and the team is that they didn't stay focused on the problem. They always lifted their eyes and focused on how are we going to come out of the pandemic and how are we going to not only lift the classic center, but lift this community in a way that's meaningful at the end of this. And uh, I think by focusing on the details of the arena, we have done just that. Most estimates said that we would not come out of this till 2025. And we know that this arena will be built in the fall of 2023 and have a profound impact on the economy, room nights and job creation. Uh, in Athens. We also wanted to let you know that during this time we engaged our community in a very meaningful way. And we said with this arena coming in, how can we take it a step further? And uh, after we interviewed some 75 people, they came back with the idea that it was time to elevate the music by putting the Music Hall of Fame in the concourse of the new venue elevate education by making it a full campus-wide learning lab, uh, actually being able to bring people along in their education, and then elevate the entertainment, doing what the Peace Center did for Greenville, by creating an endowment that would allow us to get the very best shows touring through our, our area. We have bounced back with this budget before you. We are back to 2.1 million in space rent that is on the books. We estimate we'll come in at 58,000 room nights, have hotel tax of 2.2 million and 575 events generating about 50 million back to the local economy. I think it's also important that during this time, uh, you might remember that the short-term rental uh, Airbnb funding came through and we have dedicated all of that to the repayment of the debt so that we could have the kind of facility we wanted to have uh, with the arena going forward. So as I said from the beginning, I am super proud of how we came through the pandemic, but I'm also proud that we emerged stronger. 
And uh, to really illustrate that, I couldn't stop at FY23. I had to peak a little bit at FY24 because the arena won't come online until the fall of 23. But once that year comes about, we predict that we will be looking at 3 million in space rent, 100,000 room nights in that first year, 2.6 in hotel tax, 700 events, and 75 million in economic impact. And uh, certainly we're gonna remain true to our higher wages uh, as we open the arena and we'll be able to do that. And that has all been programmed into our budgeting. Um, we have shifted our HR department to be a far more recruiting HR department going forward. Uh, extensive economic impact is forecasted uh, as well as a, a much higher quality of life for the residents here. So uh, hopefully you would agree uh, that not only did we make it through, but we came through a bit stronger and uh, maybe a bit brighter at the same time. Great, thanks for that, Paul. We appreciate it a great deal. And thanks for everything your staff do. I wanna open it up to questions from my colleagues on the commission. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kramer. Uh, I, uh, I, I guess I'm always amazed at the impact the Classic Center has on this community. Just last weekend, the, the choral event that was hosted there turned downtown Athens basically into another game day. I mean, yeah. it was had a tremendous positive economic impact on the community, and it was a it was a choral event for middle school and high school, I believe. So, um, seeing this exciting expansion of the arena, uh, looking at the work you've done for the sustainability, the the solar array is tremendously impressive, and uh, hearing your continued commitment for living wages for the workers there. Uh, makes me very happy uh, to continue my support for this institution and, and see what greater things you have in store for the community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other commissioners, uh, Commissioner Houle. Thanks, Mayor. And yeah, thanks for being with us here, Paul. Um, yeah, I, I too wanted to talk about wages. I really appreciate what Russell was saying there, and I'm glad you, you mentioned that. Um, I saw in the packet it also mentioned proper wages. And I, you know, I do want to thank the Classic Center for being a leader and, and pegging the wage floor to the, the MIT living wage calculator before this government did. Um, but as I understood it, when we last talked about this in, in more detail, you all had been pegging it to that adult, uh, adult in the two adult household, a two income household figure, which I think lands it at 11 and change, 1146 these days. Um, it, was, it was 1168, but that was back when we were getting Splos passed. I think it's probably crept up by now. Yeah, so the, the, the figure that I like to look at a lot is for a single single adult um, with, with no children to start somewhere feasible to start, and that would be 1440 right now. And, you know, some others tonight have talked about that $15 floor, and that's what we've talked about on this commission and brought up uh, our commission to as well. So I was just curious your thoughts on how – if there's a plan already for the Classic Center to get up to 15 as well, or if not, you know, what we can do to ensure that that's the direction the Classic Center can go as well. Yeah, what we've committed to, we're going to stand behind. And uh, I'm happy to work towards more. I'm happy to work and see ways that we can get it there. But it is a balancing act with all of the things, uh, making sure that we're putting money back into the building as well as the people. I will tell you though, I would almost defy you to find another employer that is doing so much for lifting our employees up, showing them what those pathways are, connecting them with the educational institutions, and then offering them direct grants. I think that that is just a, an amazing opportunity. In fact, uh, Amanda Moses just went through that whole process. She started out as a uh, housekeeper, she went through the whole program, two years at Athens Tech, two years at Piedmont, and uh, just last week she was offered an assistant general manager's job at the Hyatt, re at the Hyatt uh, next to us. So um, the, the system does work, and I will tell you that they're, they're very excited about going through that process.
And uh, Tim next, and then Carol. Thank you, Mayor. Um, thanks for being with us, Paul. I really appreciate it and appreciate the, the great presentation. And um, I had uh, my, my first question, two types of questions I had to get. My first question was like, you talked about the Airbnb uh, revenue coming through now, and that y'all have uh, kind of gone ahead and, and are diverting all that towards the debt repayment. Uh, do you have numbers on, on 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 how much that is at this point, or how much it's been? I think it's uh, David might be able to correct me. I saw him on online, but I think it's about my portion of that is roughly four hundred thousand uh, dollars in this next year's budget. So okay. the hotel, uh, the Airbnb rather tax, uh, is far more robust than what I, I expected it would be. Uh, but it's worked out well so that we can dedicate that to the debt debt service repayment. Okay. So that portion that you guys you guys are receiving about four hundred thousand, right? That yeah, and that's I'm very glad that all that's finally working through so that we're getting those funds. Um and then connected to that uh uh similar question for the um for the increase being requested, well eight hundred and sixty nine thousand roughly or eight sixty eight, six forty. Um, I know you have a list of, of items there. The first one being again uh, uh, the existing debt payments. Uh, what what percentage of that eight hundred sixty eight thousand uh, increase request is is going to that repayment? Um, you know the um, the increase that is coming to us is coming directly from the hotel tax uh, and and no other source. I, I just wanted to kind of get that okay. out of the way. I think a lot of that is, um, some of that is going directly towards staffing, ratcheting up our staffing, both in terms of hourly and then the impact it has on, on the regular. I think in this budget year, we are not using those funds directly for repayment of the debt. I think the hotel tax portion begins to enter in the year 2023 or 2024 because we did put off some of those payments through amortizing the interest uh, on the way through. Giving ourselves a little more time to ramp up with the business coming in from the new arena as we're not open yet. Okay, I think I follow. Okay, thank you, Paul. Thanks, we'll, uh, we'll wrap this segment with uh, Carol and then uh, we'll take about a 10 minute break before returning to talk to the Convention of Visitors Bureau. Yeah, I don't have any, I, I have to read this report more carefully. Just wanted to thank Paul for the presentation. And of course, that wonderful solar array. Um, you know, I know I've been pushing you in that direction. Um, and I also really appreciate we, the, the focus that you put on the career development as well and the career path. Um, because I, I, th I think that's really important, having worked with a lot of young people and returning adults, that there be that path that, that someone can move forward. So uh, appreciative of that. That's all Thank for you now. Very, very much. And thanks for pushing me on the solar array and the other ways that we can be a bit more efficient. It really does feel good once that's locked and loaded and installed. Um, makes me feel good about what we're doing. All right. Well, thank you all. I appreciate that. We're going to take a short little hiatus and I'll see everybody back at seven o'clock. All thanks to you and your staff. Thank you again.
Katie, I'll turn it over to you uh, and uh, your partners and board members from the Athens Convention and Visitors Bureau. Well, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Williams, director of the Athens Convention and Visitors Bureau. I'm pleased to be here tonight to present our FY23 budget. Um, but a little bit about the CVB, just uh, for those who may not be as familiar or maybe new. Um, yes, we, you know, our primary mission is to promote Athens as a destination for tourism. And the purpose and result of that is economic development. But the CVB and economic development is so much more than that. Um, tourism is a shared community value that supports all of Athens Clark County residents through their, uh, their businesses. Um, it certainly increases the quality of life for our residents and ultimately generates tax revenue for community projects that you all identify for our community. Um, looking back at FY22, or rather looking year to date in 2022, the great news, as Paul talked about earlier, is that tourism is back on track in Athens. In January, we saw hotel occupancy surpass that of 2019, which is a benchmark we're using for comparison. Um, so we did reach 55%. And then another important metric that is often looked at in tourism to identify travel sentiment and the interest of travelers is website traffic. Um, our goal this year was to grow website traffic just by 10% over 2019. And we're very pleased to say that visitathensga.com is at 45% over 2019. So the demand and interest is certainly there. A major milestone that we have been working on this year is our strategic plan. I'm very grateful to the CVB Advisory Board for prioritizing this, not only for our organization, but for our community as we look to the future of tourism in Athens. Um, so the goal for the strategic plan is to understand who's coming to Athens today or who could potentially be coming to Athens today and how can we market more effectively um, again, as an organization, but what are the what are things that we can be doing as a community as well to attract these visitors? We have completed three different kinds of research to gather input, a meeting planner survey, as well as interviews with meeting planners, a perception study in five competitive cities, um, understanding both people's perception of Athens, whether or not they have ever been here before. And then we did also did a resident survey because their um, input is is just as valuable and they are just as passionate about the future of Athens as, uh, as we are for our visitors. And then where we are right now is in the planning stage of the strategic plan. The strategic plan will be divided into three different sectors. So activate are those things that the CVB staff can move forward on. Collaborate and advocate will be championed by our board of directors and we'll be working with our community partners to, um, to grow those and foster tourism. So some of the highlights from 2022 really came out of collaboration. Collaboration is key to the success of any community, but certainly um, as we were emerging out of the pandemic, we relied heavily on collaborating with our local partners. One thing that we did create in FY22 um, that had wonderful success this first year was Athens Restaurant Week. This was a direct result of conversations we had with our restaurateurs uh, it will be coming back in July 2022, and we're pleased to share that 100% of the participants strongly agreed that they would participate again. We also launched the Athens Beer Trail to tap into the beer tourism market that is a uh, growing and emerging trend among travelers today. Um, of course, we worked with all six of our local breweries to, um, to launch this product. It was championed by all of them, and we're really excited about where this is headed. It just launched in October, and we just had to replenish all six breweries with trail guides this week. So the number of people who are out touring our breweries, who are collecting their beer glasses at the Welcome Center, um, it's great. We're having a meeting in a few weeks to talk about the next steps of how we can expand this program. Of course, we, uh, we as Athens, 
uh, had to leverage the wonderful opportunity that came out of the, the national championship win. There was a lot of attention on Athens. Our website saw tremendous traffic that week. Um, and I'm really proud of the way Hannah, our marketing director, and her team quickly responded with a video and marketing campaign called The City of Champions Between the Hedges and Beyond to, um, to leverage this opportunity while the attention is on us and give us a chance to talk about the other ways that Athens um, is a champion. So this marketing campaign will continue in the spring and certainly through the fall. And then finally, a new thing that a, a new collaborative effort that just began in January is we are partnering with Lou Hammond Group, which is a national PR firm who specializes in travel and tourism. We completed an RFP process and selected them as our PR agency partner. Um, in six weeks, they've already secured three stories about our partners and have booked two upcoming travel writers. So our current contract is through June 2022, but we're really looking forward to we're continuing to work with them as we expand uh, media outreach for Athens. And I did want to mention that we are prioritizing storytelling of our minority owned businesses and being sure to connect with diverse writers and outlets so that our message about Athens is um, wide reaching across audi all audiences. All right, so some success with sales this year. They have been busy, busy, of course, with the return of meetings and conventions. Um, we have booked 24,000 future room nights, and they have actualized 26,000 room nights this year. Um, most of those have actualized and booked just since October. So you can see the, the return has been very strong just in the past few months. Um, and of those 26,000, 14,000 have booked in our housing bureau which is a wonderful resource for our meeting planners, making it very easy for them to offer multiple hotel blocks to their attendees. And it also serves as a revenue source for the CBB. And then of course we are focused on the arena, which will open um, in October or November, 2023. We recently um, elevated one of our sales managers to arena sales manager to focus specifically on booking those conventions and sporting events at the arena. So looking ahead to FY23, hotel tax revenue is being projected at 1.3 million in FY23. This is a number we worked on with Chris Caldwell and his team. Um, but as mentioned before in Paul's presentation, the addition of short-term rental tax revenue has positively impacted our budget. Um, of the hotel tax that we receive, we're seeing it represents about 20% of hotel tax. We are also carefully tracking um, through a resource called AirDNA, the occupancy and ADR of short-term rentals. So we'll look forward to having um, after this year, uh, a full year of that data to help us better understand how to project and track that in the future. As I mentioned, uh, the Housing Bureau, as well as registration services are two services that the CVV offers to basically help the meeting planners hit the easy button when planning a meeting here in Athens. And it provides about another $100,000 in revenue for the CVB. On the expense side, you can see this chart. What I wanna note about this is that um, in CVB industry, it's considered best practice to spend the majority of your hotel motel tax revenue on marketing and sales. That's ultimately what's going to best support the community its businesses, our residents, and deliver the greatest ROI for all of you. And I'm very proud to say that we continue to prioritize um, our resources toward marketing and sales. 31% goes to uh, the people, 11% on administrative services, 13% uh, of our total budget, which includes housing and registration, goes to the Historic Athens Welcome Center. But as you all know, they receive 15% of our hotel motel tax. Um, and then 45% on marketing and sales. So you can see here a breakdown of the revenue um, and we are presenting a balanced budget. So total revenue is coming in at 1.4 million for FY23, expenses budgeted to that line as well. <clears throat> One thing we're gonna be focusing on heavily um, 
in the first part of FY23 is a brand marketing campaign. This came out as a direct result of our research that we've recently done as perception study that people in Georgia often know Athens, but people beyond Georgia um, may not be as familiar. And a brand marketing campaign uh, can have a lot of wonderful benefits for a community. We can look just north of us to Greenville to see the success that their CVB's campaign, yeah, that Greenville has had on economic development, meetings and conventions, and tourism. So we are excited to be working toward a very large brand marketing campaign for Athens. Um, and I think it is important to remember that meeting planners and convention attendees see leisure marketing as well. So this campaign, while it will be um, positioned as a leisure campaign, talking about all that Athens has to offer um, in ways that people can enjoy Athens, the people that will see it will also be selecting Athens as, as meetings destination and choosing to attend meetings in Athens. Our target audiences, this was, um, discovered in research several years ago, but reaffirmed in the research we just completed. Um, millennials continue to be our target, top market coming to Athens um, for leisure travel. So they love everything we have here and they're coming both with and without their children. So we have an opportunity to, to target them uh, in, in multiple ways. UGA alumni are probably our greatest advocates. They are advocating for meetings to be held here. They're wanting to come to meetings here. They wanna come back for weekend getaways. So we're gonna leverage that passion and turn them into our meeting planners, our meeting attendees and our leisure travelers. And then of course, meeting planners, um, identifying new opportunities to connect with new meeting planners and showing them that Athens is the answer. Sometimes they may think that Athens won't work for their group or their attendees can't get here or we're not a good fit. Um, but if we can show them in our research program prove this as well. Once they get here and they have that first meeting, they are loyal to Athens. So we're excited to look at new ways to show them why Athens is the perfect place for their next meeting. So marketing strategy, again, this is mostly targeted at leisure, but important to remember that meeting planners and convention attendees fall in this as well. So we're focusing on awareness. I've already talked a little bit about that. Collaboration, continuing to identify ways to package and expand product offerings. So Athens Beer Trail and Restaurant Week, of course, will be two of those, but we are exploring other ways to collaborate with our businesses in the community. And then storytelling. Um, really what we aim to do is to amplify the stories of our community, particularly the local businesses who may not have ways to market otherwise and help um, amplify their message and inspire visitors, promote their businesses and provide resources. On the sales side, we will also be focusing on awareness, certainly with the new arena on board. There's a lot of uh, educating to be education to be done and opportunities to identify new groups for Athens. Attracting meeting planners here. Again, if we can get them here through a site visit or a fam tour, they can see firsthand why Athens is the perfect place for their meeting. And then ultimately converting those, uh, those sales efforts into booked room nights. Uh, we do have a goal of 58,000 room nights in FY 28, 23 and 70,000 future room nights. And then finally, the strategic plan. Um, our board will be wrapping up this plan this spring and we look forward to introducing the plan to all of you and our tourism partners and stakeholders at an annual meeting this fall. We'll be prioritizing the plan over a three-year implementation period and then executing it based on the activate, collaborate, and advocate strategies. So that is all. I just wanted to thank you all for um, your leadership for Athens and for your trust in the CVB. It is certainly my absolute honor to serve as CVB director here in Athens. I'm tremendously excited about the direction where we are headed as a community, um, the people that are here, the passion that is occurring around town, and it, looking forward to being a part of it in the in the years to come. So thank you for the opportunity, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Thanks for that, Katie, and thanks for all the work you do to highlight the great things that our community offers. I uh, want to go ahead and open it up to commissioners for who might have questions. Hey, Mr. Mayor. Go right ahead, Russell. Um, 
thank you for for the work you do, Katie. Um, I, uh, I I am happy to see the um, CVB sort of in their products online, moving towards possibly creating sort of a more uh, broad appeal for Athens. I, I know when I first moved here uh, some years ago on the CVB website, there were, there were just, there were just bulldogs everywhere. You click on hotels, there's like a bulldog in a hotel bed. You click on music, there's like a bulldog playing a guitar. Um, you know, I think I, I love the dogs. Don't get me wrong, but uh, UGA has a tremendous marketing program in and of themselves. And I think Athens just has so much to offer, you know, beyond the bulldogs. So, um, I, I appreciate y'all sort of moving in a more unifying, you know, there's people in Georgia who go to Georgia tech, you know? So if we stake our publicity too far on the bulldogs, I mean, it, it doesn't really serve us well. So I, I, I like seeing y'all sort of incorporate some, some more refreshing, broad appeal based, you know, really, you know, tapping into that, creative force behind Athens too, I think is a great draw. And I, I know you've, y'all have done some work on, on the black history month here in Athens and some, some other things. So I, I'm, I'm really most excited about that. Um, seeing y'all sort of, you know, build upon what UGA does, but don't go too far down the bulldog road. So, um, but thank, thank you for the work you're doing. I appreciate it. Thank you for that feedback. Thanks, Commissioner, for uh, putting in your application as the next hairy dog. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Commissioner Houle. Thanks, Mayor. Russell has me cracking up over here. That was good. I, I, I second his motions. Uh, and so forgive my ignorance here. I'm not super familiar with the structure of your organization. It might just be that you've only got a handful of people employed and they're all making incredible salaries. Um, but my topic of the day today is wages. So I just have to ask if you could enlighten me that uh, percentage of your pie chart that's going to the people, you know, how many people are we talking and, and uh, what's the wage floor for those folks? Sure. So currently um, we have, we can't, we've got a, myself as director, we have a director of sales and director of marketing. Um, under sales, we have two more positions currently and a third position that we are currently um, hiring for. So that would bring our sales team to four. Um, a marketing, under marketing, we've got our director of marketing and then a full-time communications manager. So we have two full-time people in marketing. Um, we do offer internships throughout the year that are paid. And then we have a um, part-time um, assistant receptionist position. That is currently the only part-time hourly wage person. Um, and if I may ask, although this is, I guess, about just the one person right now, but um, does that person make 15 or more per hour? Um, they do not. Uh, they are budgeted within the Classic Center's hourly wage. Okay, they're within the Classic Center's wage. Okay. Yes, so we are, and just a, a little bit of background, we are actually a department within the Classic Center. Um, I mentioned board, but our board is an advisory board. Uh, we're very thankful for them, but we do, we are a department within the Classic Center and all of our staff are considered Classic Center employees. Okay. So the, the question really about all this is more, if we're talking about the Classic Center generally, that would automatically affect you all, basically? It absolutely would. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. I thought I saw another hand a moment ago. Uh, Carol. Yeah, thank you so much. This is really great. Love it all. Um, and actually, while, while someone else was speaking, I was just checking the site to see if uh, you had the Athens is listed. It is one of the 10 top places in the world for cycling. And indeed you do, Lonely Planet. Um, it's a little bit of a stretch, but we're right up there with a lot of really, really incredible places. Um, but I hope also when we get the Firefly in the next couple of years, I mean, I really think that that as a uh, as economic development 
um, our trails are really going to be at a point where they can bring, bring people for a day um, or two days out over here. So I think that's a wonderful opportunity. Um, I just wanted to ask you this on the additional funds. Um, and I'm looking at the report that, you know, we all have from you. It says additional funds received from hotel motel tax go to directly to operating costs to including marketing sales, promotional services to fulfill our mission. So this is an increase of $500,000. Is that correct? Am I reading that correctly? Um, that is probably correct based on how concern, how, I mean, quite honestly low our budget was in FY22 and FY21 because of the pandemic and then the, okay. the increase of short-term rentals, which were not included in our FY22 budget. And, and so uh, Carol, just to jump in for a second, the yeah. CVB receives a defined proportion of our hotel motel tax okay. revenue. So that it's it, it, it's always relative to whatever the anticipated total take is of hotel motel tax. Oh, okay. You mean, so it's not something we decide on? Th that's right. It's not a kind of... Uh, really <laughs> good. We're, we're good, funded good. by, I think it's 314 2%. Okay. Oh, great. One less decision to make there. That's good. Um, but, it's a good life when you can take a decision off the table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on so your note on the firefly trail. Yes. Outdoor activities, including cycling, but all of our trails, parks, we heavily promoted that during the pandemic because that was what travelers were looking to do. And yeah. just to note, we completed our research and um, during the pandemic, it was the first time we had ever advertised in the Nashville market. We advertised mm -hmm. in the Nashville market using digital advertising to promote Athens outdoor activities. And in this research, this perception research, the people in Nashville, the number one thing they identified to do in Athens is outdoor activities. So that's just I, two points. Yeah, I think, Katie, actually, that's really, that's really wonder, wonderful. Um, and um, it's it's sparking something in my head to promote that as well, um, because I think that some of our bike trails, our greenway trails, and such, um, have been getting a little bit of beat up on a little bit. And I think that their role in economic development um, needs to be highlighted for members of the community and for the commission as well, because I, that is a growing. Uh, market. Um, it's a change world. It crosses demographics. It crosses, uh, um, you know, political lines. Um, and so I, I think it's it, it it does have a lot of opportunities here. So um, keep highlighting that for us, okay? We absolutely will. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for that, uh, uh, Katie. And thanks, Carol. And, and just as a side note, interestingly enough, I did an interview with a travel publication today. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I highlighted was outdoors generally and specifically mm -hmm. cycling opportunities. So, yes, I, I, and actually, let me just in case there are any paddlers out there, these two rivers, too, another wonderful. I mean, there's two days, um, you know, of an activity. I just returned from Portland, Maine, um, and really where my brother lives, but it was all these outdoor activities that, you know, make me want to just keep going back, besides my brother and his family as well. But thank you. Thank All you. right. Well, thank you. And Katie, I appreciate the work that you and your staff do and your advisory board. Uh, I see many of you here on the call tonight. Um, thanks a lot. It, it, it takes a village and uh, we, we've got the right village here. Well, it's absolutely our pleasure. Thank you all for what you're doing. All right. We are going to transition here in just a moment. Uh, I believe the penultimate presentation tonight is from the Athens Cultural Affairs Commission. Uh, and then finally, we're going to hear from the Athens Downtown Development Authority. So I do see Andrew Salinas here from the Athens Cultural Affairs Commission. And uh, you have had a very busy year. Uh, I, I, I don't know that I can count all the great things that have been going on here, but I'm glad you've got a presentation lined up for us so yes. that you can recount the glory. Great I have a lot of pretty pictures so that you can literally recount them along with me. Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Thanks. Thanks for, for sitting down with us tonight. Um, so, so I'm Andrew Salinas, the, the chairperson in a volunteer capacity of the Athens Cultural Affairs Commission. Um, we're, we're proud to report that, that we have, in fact, had another busy year. And, and I just want to share 
Um, a few visual examples of what the mayor and commission's continued investment in public art has meant for Athens, and then we can save time at the end that we need for uh, questions about our, our budget request this year. Um, so, quickly, um, you'll see my screen still. Okay. So yeah, we have the Whitehall Roundabout, um, which which is one of our um, five SPLOS projects that have had ribbon cutting since the summer. Um, and, and as most of you probably know, um, the SPLOS projects are, are funded with 1% from all construction budgets, all capital budgets from SPLOS projects are earmarked for public art. I wanna say that's a beautiful funding mechanism that is quite rare in Georgia. So, so that will keep um, enhancing our artistic identity as a community. Um, here's one at the fire station. Um, literally across from that one is um, a, a piece of art that is perhaps putting West Athens on the public art map. Um, this is, if you haven't seen it yet, um, outside the cooperative extension, and it is a 20 foot tall chicken slash weather vane with a concrete egg, first of top of concrete egg that you could actually climb into if you wanted uh, with a, a four foot uh, circumference there to climb into. Um, Dudley Park, this this lovely heron mosaic um, by Krisha Ara. The Greenway project is, is one of our, is our largest project from the past year. And, and that is, is a striking um, um, visual uh, on, on this hill along the Greenway. And, and you know, this is one example of, of how the public art has, has caused um, multiple departments within the county government to um, take this part of land uh, a, a lot more seriously. And there have been proposals um, from sustainability and, and other um, departments in, in your government to, to have um, an ADA compliant path up to this, along with some invasive species mitigation, um, which, which um, wouldn't have happened without this public art. Um, our Athens Music Walk of Fame is um, a popular uh, uh, new work of public art. We will keep um, installing five uh, new plaques um, with this original design by a local graphic designer um, each year. So we'll have five new ones each year. We met um, the, the Walk of Fame selection committee, um, nominating committee met uh, two weeks ago to nominate the next five which is obviously a guarded secret within the mayor's office. We'll tell you later. Um, Arts and Community Awards. This one felt really good. Um, you, you might have noticed a flourishment of performance and, and other forms of, of visual and public art over the last year. And that is in large part from the mayor and commission's direct investment in, in public art. If, if you guys recall, um, in May 2020, the Athens Cultural Affairs Commission had a proposal to um, to put forth $15,000 of our funds towards investment to provide COVID relief for our artists who, who were really struggling early in the pandemic. The mayor and commission stepped up in a really big way, coming up with $85,000 of their own to make for an even $100,000 in COVID relief um, payable with uh, 50 awards of $2,000 each. Uh, we did have 47 of the 50 awardees complete their project successfully. The other three awardees couldn't complete their projects for a variety of reasons and return their funds back to the county. Um, so for the majority of awardees, and, and this is important, um, this was their first public art commission. So again, for the majority of awardees, this was their first public art commission in any capacity. And, and this kind of, of grassroots investment is going to be the only way that we can hold on to our identity as an artistic community and a community of artists in, in years to come. Um, so again, large scale arts funding like this will enhance the professionalism of our community of artists, um, make them competitive for, for opportunities locally, as well as nationally and perhaps globally, and it's investment that we need to make more often. Um, this um, allowed us to fund things that we don't normally fund. In fact, um, we, we only have one budget source, it's our small operating budget that allows us to, to fund performance at all. 
Otherwise, our, our budget sources are, are reserved solely for capital expenditures, which would preclude investment in performative arts. Um, we had uh, some animation, and, and you might recognize some, some local Athenians here in, in squiggly form. We have more performance, and, and this one was quite lovely, if any of you all caught it. We have temporary exhibitions, um, in this case, fashion. We have a pop-up photo exhibitions, and, and this one spiraled into a photo exhibition of, of all the Athenses nationally and globally um, contributing to this project, um, which turned out uh, quite lovely and, and was a fun collaboration with, with our, our sister and brother cities. Um, writing projects, um, which I will say are our uh, current Poet Laureate initiative also um, is, is our first opportunity to, to invest in uh, writing our, our uh, literary arts um, over our 11 year history. It allowed us to find a permanent home for um, this massive community art project, uh, Imagination Squared, comprised of, of 1,200 five inch blocks um, made by 1,200 uh, artists locally. And, and this will have again, a permanent home inside the uh, public library allowed us to offset expenses of large community performances that have multiple um, funding sources. And in this case, a porch fest, we're just a, a small piece of the funding puzzle, but, but happy to, to be uh, among the many. Um, we were able to invest in, in local documentary films, uh, hip hop as well, as well as uh, work labor rights. And um, this Mural Alley project, which is a, a glorious and, and vibrant new addition to an, an alleyway that um, uh, frankly smelled of urine most of the time. Um, I, I'm happy to report anecdotally on my observations that, that it is no longer um, smelling that way. Um, and, and so um, th this is one of many examples um, where, where public art can, can cause um, all kinds of community members to um, treat the surrounding environment as, as more sacred. Um, it, uh, we had some temporary exhibitions within unexpected places. In, in this case, Project Flanagan will have um, an exhibition at the Bethel Home site before its demolition, as um, other communities, Atlanta, New Orleans, and more have done with um, their public housing before it was raised in, in a way that really brings the community together and helps for artistic planning of what's to come next at this site, as we will do at Bethel. Um, it, it allowed us to invest in organizations that uh, serve our youth, in, in this case, a step show, which, which is a, a, an art, a form of art that we had never funded before. Dance. And, and also more traditional smaller scale works of permanent art, like this new edition or these new editions at uh, Sandy Creek. Um, this one outside the Jittery Joe's Roaster, which is a, a lovely permanent work of public art um, th that, that is, uh, you know, really grand to say that um, a $2,000 award can create something permanent in our community. A beautiful new mural inside one of our local high schools. Um, in this case, uh, this, this allowed Will Eskridge to um, create a, a larger scale mural than he'd ever had the opportunity for. And, and he would say that this opportunity really enhanced his professionalism and it is uh, allowing him to create more murals with CCSD. And, and this mural as well, which was just put up um, a month ago at uh, Hawthorne and Oglethorpe. In almost every instance, our 50 awardees really outperformed the $2,000 budget, their payment. Thus, in this budget cycle, you, you see us asking for moving beyond the $2,000 awards. Frankly, we, we have played too cheap with our local artists for far too long. So now we are asking for an increase in our operating budget um, to, to increase our awards to $5,000 each. Um, and we'll have three awards um, with, with your approval, of course, three awards uh, in the fall and again in the spring. So we'll have a total of six awards throughout the year, $5,000 each. 
these increased award amounts will offer, frankly, stronger budgets, larger scale projects, and increase the likelihood that our artists can take some profit for themselves, which, frankly, they're not really able to do um, that often at the $2,000 award amount. I, I would say the, the impetus for the $100,000 in, in COVID relief for our local artists was, was to put some money in, in, in the pockets of our local artists, maybe ease the burden of grocery bills for, for a couple of months, um, as, as well as um, have some art that we all could appreciate in a time when we really needed to, when, when other live performance was really shut down. Um, and, and I will say, um, most of our 50 awardees didn't really have anything left over to compensate themselves for their own labor at the $2,000 award amount. So um, we, we really need to consider upping our investment in, in local art and for these local arts awards. And um, I, I want to use the next fiscal year as, as do the other ACAC commissioners to really test um, whether or not the $5,000 award amount is, hits the sweet spot of providing larger scale projects while allowing our artists to, to take more profit for themselves and, and compensate themselves for their own time and labor. I'll also say, um, three years ago, uh, the Cultural Affairs Commission began a practice to pay out of our own discretionary funds for, for local artist apprentices for um, our, our larger scale projects upon occasion. Um, and, and this specific instance was the Hot Corner mural. That was our first time bringing in a local artist um, apprentice, artist assistant, to, to help the lead artist um, who, who was selected from a blind call, in this case, a national call that had 45 submissions. Um, and, and I will say that Broderick's participation in this one allowed the muralists to complete the mural on a new wall that was 40% larger than they were contractually obligated to. So, so our um, investment in, in local artist assistance actually allowed um, this uh, our, our muralists to, to adjust when we had to scramble and find a new wall. And I will say um, this work of public art led to a public conversation about how to better use the land adjacent to this mural. Um, we had a, a potluck for artists. We had a, a few of the mayor and commission come up and, and count the 17 parking spots in the parking lot that this mural now overlooks and say, you know what, this should really be a green space and not a parking spot for 17 county vehicles. And, and I'm proud to say that three months with, within three months of this mural's completion, there was a proposal for just that, our first pocket park downtown. I'll also say that bringing in local artist assistants um, makes our artists, again, more competitive um, by apprenticing under uh, uh, perhaps um, lead artists with more prominence or, or at least a more established public art career. And this is an example of, of something Broderick has done in another community um, funded from the National Endowment for the Arts in Kinston, North Carolina. You can really see where, where his participation um, and, and this mural with Elio Marcardo from the Miami area really enhanced his own professionalism and allowed him to execute larger scale murals on his own in, in a way that Broderick really hadn't done before this experience. Um, similarly for the Rainbow Forest, um, by bringing two local artist assistants and apprentices into this project, we're able to execute um, this really ambitious project, and you see the aerial view to the right, with it within a really tight turnaround. So to conclude, ACAC is, is one of our county's most ambitious volunteer commissions, and, and I'm happy to, to lead this organization for another year, and, and then I'll have exhausted my term limits. We're asking for an increase in our operating budget, again, to, to allow us to be even more ambitious. With three awards of $5,000 for, for local public arts awards once in the fall and again in the spring, um, that, that's one of our asks for our operating budget this year. We also ask for funds to complete a new website that will include an interactive public art map for athens Clark County, um, works that we've commissioned as, as well as um, those that, that, that have been um, commissioned or um, have sprouted up elsewhere um, for, for other reasons or from other um, organizations. 
And, and, and here's why. We, we describe ourselves as a community of artists, and, and we're happiest when, when that's how our outsiders perceive us as well. But, it, but if we don't continue to invest in our local artists, and if we don't routinely reassess the ways in which we invest in our local artists, we will lose the ability to credibly claim that we're a community of artists, which is a large part of our county's identity. Um, so, so we're currently working um, with, with a group uh, from the University of Georgia's business school to, to examine funding sources that could be more sustainable. Um, and, and I happen to get sit in the last presentations, so I will say specifically the hotel motel tax. Um, I, I'm, I'm currently uh, working with a group to investigate how much leeway and latitude we have locally to, um, to, to consider broader disbursement of the hotel motel tax, specifically for investment in arts and culture. And I don't mean just for the Athens Cultural Affairs Commission, I mean for arts and culture more broadly um, as it lives and thrives um, in, in our um, several dozen local um, arts organizations who are in, in, in most cases pretty substantially underfunded. Thanks for that, Andrew. I appreciate it a great deal. Um, and, and just to um, address th that element of um, funding in the community, uh, hotel motel taxes are really tightly prescribed by the way that the state code is written. So every community that has a hotel motel tax sort of has this component of the code of Georgia, almost particular to that community. So, you know, Rome has this very tightly defined model and Valdosta does and Columbus does and, and, and Athens as well. But um, we, we, I think, are a flexible and thoughtful and creative community. So I, I think we are always open to looking for some, um, some opportunities. So. Absolutely. And, and this team specifically is um, hoping to reach out to 40 counties and municipalities throughout Georgia um, large and small, to, to get a sense of how much latitude we have for the hotel motel tax within the state's prescriptions. So, um, I, I'm, you know, last night I watched an hour long tutorial on, on the hotel motel tax and I'm learning the nuances of, of that particular local tax policy. And I understand the limitations, but, but, but I think the time has come for a broader discussion. Um, once we get a better sense of how much latitude we do have within the prescriptions of, of the state. Congratulations for still being with us tonight after right. having done that last night. Um, I, I, I want just a couple of minutes for commission questions because we, we do have sure. one more presentation. Yeah. So. Uh, Tim. Yeah. Sorry, I don't moderate this. Uh, well, thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Andrew. Uh, and, and definitely appreciate this. And um, I, I, I think that you very well established the uh, the, the almost immeasurable value that um, that the very little funding that you are getting right now goes to, and how how much it expands uh, quality of life and stuff here in Athens. And I think it, it makes there's a lot of merit for us trying to expand that, especially trying to get the the grants larger so that the artists are able to uh, keep more for their own, increase the quality of life too. Um, I think I think my my question probably is more of a, a, a comment, maybe to staff of something that I would like us to look into. Um, and I, I definitely want this to be sustainable as we move forward. Um, so this isn't necessarily a sustainable thing for years to come, but going back to that, we did the resiliency awards um, and use some use CARES funding uh, to be able to uh, expand out that. Um, I, I would love for us to be able to, uh, again, look at some of the, uh, uh, the ARPA funds that we're doing here, um, especially when it, in the in the in the realm of uh, worker support and economic development, that we that bucket that we have there, about uh, being able to carve out some funding uh, to do uh, these grant awards that we're talking about here, or even expanding it out again like we did before, and offer, be able to offer even more. Uh, but I would love for that to be part of that discussion uh, around economic development and a worker support bucket. Thanks, Tim. And and for viewers, uh, that that worker support component is one of those that um, we we intend to do some additional work on 
uh, to, to fully define that, and, and arts definitely could be a component. Uh, uh, one other before we hit the last one, Carol. No, Andrew, I just wanted to uh, again say thank you. I love that idea that, that Tim came up. Each one of the presentations tonight really makes us see in what incredible work like is being given to our community from all these diverse parts, from arts and leisure and, and helping those who are, are less well off in different ways. Um, and I, you know, the arts are, it's, it's added so much. Every time I see that rainbow forest or I go by these pieces of art that are out in the public, um, you know, and I, lo I love the idea of there being a better website to find them all and, right. and uh, use that again with our travel, with, with our travel uh, and visitors who were here before, you know, just another, another thing to, to do when you're in Athens. So thank you so much. Of course, I, I will say uh, cultural affairs is a really strong body right now. Um, all, all 11 commissioners are, are really seriously minded about public art and, and um, all forms of art in our community. And um, we, we should capitalize on, on the strength of that body right now. Yeah, and, and actually, the particularly the diversity of the artistic experiences, are, uh, your, your presentation really highlighted that, so thank you. Absolutely, and, and we are attentive to, to ensuring that, that we're we, we try to continuously reassess the ways we do things to, to ensure that, that our spending is truly democratic and, and that um, all Athenians have access to um, the, the works of art that, that we commission, um, whether they're, they're on the fabrication side or, or just on the enjoyment side of things. So, so thank you, everybody. It's, it's your investment in us that, that um, keeps us motivated and energized. Uh, and thank you, Andrew, for being so supportive of this great component of our community and uh, everybody who makes this possible. All right, uh, everyone, we have uh, just a single presentation left this evening, and I do see on the screen that we have Jeremy Smith and David Lynn and Linda Ford from the Downtown Development Authority, and uh, we're here to hear about that uh, element of their funding that comes through uh, parking fees. So, uh, uh, Linda, David, Jeremy, I'm going to turn it over to you, and thank you for being here tonight. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for having us. Um, my name is Jeremy Smith. I'm the parking director for Downtown Athens Parking, and I am going to try and as quickly go over our budget as possible, since I know most of you guys are probably pretty tired, and I am a little hungry at this point. So, um, the as far as our budget goes uh, with expenses this year, we were able to maintain the level of expenses that we had previously while also raising the pay rate for every single one of our employees to at least $15 an hour. So there's not anybody that works for us that doesn't make at least $15 an hour. Anybody that writes tickets, anybody that works in the booth, everybody's making 15 or better. Uh, so we were really happy to be able to do that without raising uh, our expense level. Uh, we did adjust the uh, revenue projection somewhat. Um, and a lot of that has to do, there's a lot of factors, actually. There's, um, you know, obviously the, the construction on Clayton, the streetscape project. Uh, I believe we're going to lose 25 spaces for that uh, permanently. Uh, also, we lost 16 spaces in College Square, uh, which those were some of the most profitable spaces downtown. Um, additionally, uh, the parklets, I believe we've accounted, I believe it was 27 spaces we're being used for parklets, so that kind of also uh, caused our revenue to take a hit. Um, and then additionally, you know, just the ongoing construction, you know, where some spaces are covered up with construction or uh, construction vehicles are parked there, the crew, whomever. So it's kind of, we kind of backed off on our revenue, revenue projection because of that. Uh, but I do want to say, you know, just make it clear that we are not asking for any money. Um, you know, we, we make our own money, so. <laughs> Uh, I don't want anybody to think that we're asking for any additional money or anything like that because of any loss in parking revenue. Um, but to be honest with you, with, with that, I'll open it up with questions. Everything else is pretty similar to last year's budget. So if anybody has any questions, please go ahead. Thanks for that, Jeremy. I appreciate it. And um, uh, w w we know that both given the nature of the pandemic in the last couple of years, uh, as well as the ongoing construction at Clayton, which 
uh, finally feels like uh, has a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, sure. th- this has been an interesting time. So um, I've got a couple questions from commissioners. I'll start with Jesse. Thanks. And thanks, Jeremy. Good news in many ways. Um, I, I did. Um, I have one thought for my colleagues, and, and it starts with just a, a big thanks to you for getting those wages up to 15 an hour. It's really uh, exciting and encouraging to hear. And um, I just I hope that members of this body will think critically about how we've heard from many folks tonight about wanting to get those wages up to 15 or already getting them up to 15. And um, if we've got that hotel motel tax coming in, we have a huge bump this year that's unlikely to be repeated. Um, thanks to the the state law change regarding Airbnbs and other short term rentals. So I think it's a real opportunity for us to try to get the wage floors up in those agencies as well. And I hope we'll. I hope we'll take that seriously moving forward, but um, that's less a comment for y'all and more uh, just a thanks to y'all for doing that. Uh, well, thank um, you. My, my, my question um, is, you mentioned those spots um, being the especially profitable ones that were lost on Clayton and College Square. Are you seeing an uptick in use in the other spots or, um, or do we uh, assume that people are parking, you know, elsewhere downtown or are they doing something else instead entirely no i i would say we um and and part of this goes back to i saw some of the classic center and cvb presentation earlier and you know part of this is related to that because a lot of those conferences i know commissioner edwards had mentioned mentioned the uh, coral uh conference and i think it was a music educator conference brought something like four thousand people downtown uh, without those events going on, we took a pretty big hit from that as well, because those those things at the Classic Center and through the CDB, they bring a lot of people into town. So that that was that also affected us as well. But honestly, looking at our numbers, our monthly numbers are fairly typical with pre-pandemic levels. However, the daily usage, so people that are coming in town, say going shopping or getting something to eat, something like that, haven't quite recovered to um, 2019 levels. So we're still still trying to get back to where we were. All right, other questions for Jeremy? Jeremy, I think you called it. I think hunger has crept into the minds of everyone on this screen. How's Barbara Jean doing? She is uh, as good as can be. She's she you know, retired and then Decided that she needed something to do, so she came back and is uh, doing a little patrolling in the morning. So good, she loves it. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. All right, Jeremy, Linda, David, thank you all for the work you do, keeping downtown great, and um, look forward to seeing you soon, commissioners. uh, Thanks for your uh, attention and great questions tonight. Um, And uh, we will see uh, everybody next week, the 1st of March, at our monthly voting meeting. So please have a great night. Take care now. Thank you all. Thanks.